the media searches for a name for the murderer. First, he is called the walk-in killer and the valley intruder. Finally, he is known as the night stalker. He liked the name. He thought it was appropriate and uh, it kind of swelled him up. And you have to imagine this guy go back to his hotel, reading about the murders, reading about what the police said, and, and him really getting off behind all that because he was becoming a celebrity. He was a celebrity. Two weeks later, August 6th, Northridge. Christopher and Virginia Peterson are both shot in the head, but manage to fight off the stalker. They survive. August 8th, Diamond Bar. Elias Aboweth is shot and killed. Wife Sakina is raped and tortured, but lives. Eight days later, August 17th. Disturbing news from San Francisco. Peter and Barbara Pan are attacked in their home. He is shot dead with a 22 caliber bullet. She survives a rape and beating. The killer leaves satanic symbols on the wall. For veteran homicide investigator Frank Falzon, it was shocking. What I witnessed that day was probably one of the most horrific crime scenes I had ever seen. Falzon orders ballistic tests, checking the bullets from the San Francisco killing against those used by the Night Stalker in Los Angeles. It is a perfect match. The Night Stalker has moved north. It was the first time in my police career as an inspector that I actually slept with my uh, uh, revolver next to my bed. Mayor Diane Feinstein warned San Francisco. Uh, he's someone that will go into a home at night and will kill, and kills at random. But Feinstein does more. She describes several key clues in the case, inadvertently telling the killer what cops know. What would you do? If, if you found out all of a sudden that the cops knew you wore a certain shoe, used a certain gun, you know, and crossed your T's a certain way and dotted your I's a certain way. You start, stop crossing your T's, dotting your I's, and maybe go barefoot. And that's what happened. So, uh, uh, I was pissed. August 25th, the stalker is back in the Los Angeles area. This time, it is a shooting and rape in Mission Viejo. But the cops get a break. A neighborhood teenager has spotted a suspicious car and gives a partial license plate number to the police. Within days, they find the car, abandoned. On the back of the mirror is a fingerprint. That's the first time we'd had any type of break like that where we may be able to identify him. Detectives try to connect the print to a name, but are frustrated. Meanwhile, they get scores of new tips every day. Most go nowhere. But one pays off. A Los Angeles informant leads the cops to a large stash of property stolen from Night Stalker victims. The goods came from a drifter known only as Rick. In San Francisco, the police also connect the Night Stalker to stolen property. An informant there leads police to a woman who has some of it. She got it from an acquaintance named Rick. She was able to tell us that her boyfriend, a man named Armando Rodriguez, was Rick's best friend. Falzon goes to question Rodriguez, but he refuses to talk. He taunts Falzon. Falzon puts him in the back of a police car. The two argue. There was an exchange of blows. Uh, eventually, uh, during this exchange, uh, he blurted out the name. Rick's name is Richard Ramirez. And I remember uh, at this point in time, uh, just feeling totally drained. Uh, all the emotion just left my body. Uh, I was shaking. We finally had Rick identified. With a full name from San Francisco and a fingerprint from Los Angeles, police are able to find the thing they need most. A photograph of the man they believe is the Night Stalker. Within hours, that photograph of Richard Ramirez will be in every newspaper and on every TV station in California. All that is left now is to find him when Crime Stories returns.
August 31st, 1985, the body count mounts. As the hottest summer on record begins to cool, Californians get their first look at the man accused of terrorizing them for months. By most, he is reviled. But many also wonder how a man can come to be this way. Richard Ramirez was born in El Paso, Texas in 1960, the youngest of five children born to hard-working Mexican-American parents. His parents wanted him to share and be, have the American dream like all immigrants do. Richard grew up in a modest home in a working-class community. He was quiet. You know, he was, he was quiet. He, he was just like any other childhood boy. Richard's father had once been a police officer in Juarez, Mexico. In El Paso, he earned his living laying railroad track. He was a loving man, but he had a dark side. The family reluctantly told me that their father had a uh, very, very bad temper. Very bad temper. In fact, uh, he would get so angry at things, little domestic things, like one day he couldn't fix the sink, he'd start banging his head against the wall. The elder Ramirez's anger could just as easily be aimed at his children. At first, Richard only watched. Richard told me that it hurt him a lot and it disturbed him a lot to see his father beating his brothers. When I asked him if he, in fact, got beaten by his father, he said he would always run away, he would get away, and his father never really had the chance to get to him. For Richard, the place that he called home would always hold a certain terror. Indeed, his brothers told me that there was a pedophile that was in the house, a teacher of theirs, who was alone in the house on numerous occasions when Richard was there, and I am absolutely certain that he was sexually abused by this individual. Richard looked for comfort away from his home. The place he found was a nearby cemetery. He would spend entire nights here alone, trying to face his fears. One way is to master the fear, and by mastering the fear, it's almost like joining the enemy, identifying with the person who's frightening you. And the way to do that is to become a frightening person yourself. As a teenager, Richard suffered from seizures. No cause could be determined. He attended public schools in El Paso, where he was known as a loner but a few knew him as a dreamer. He says, my biggest ambition, miss, is to really, you know, get my, my uh, name in big lights, you know, that says Richard was here, Richard is performing here. As a child, Richard looked up to an older cousin named Mike. He was known as one of the toughest men in El Paso, a man who loved to fight. When the opportunity came to serve in Vietnam, Mike jumped at it. Mike excelled at war, but went far beyond the call of duty. Mike also decided to uh, take Vietnamese women into the jungle, where he raped them and uh, murdered them. They were the enemy. Nobody cared. It didn't matter. In fact, he took pictures of those murders. He took pictures of himself with a Polaroid camera raping these women. Mike came home to El Paso, a war hero. Richard spent long afternoons at his apartment. Mike would regale the boy with all these sadistic sexual war stories. How he took this woman and he did this, and how he murdered this woman and he did that. And he filled the kid's head with these horrible stories. And then he showed him the photographs. The two became fast friends. They'd spend nights together in the desert near El Paso, Mike teaching Richard to quietly sneak up on animals. He showed him where to put a knife to get the maximum effect. He showed him where to put a bullet to get the maximum effect. And years down the road, all those things would come into play. One day, Richard was at his cousin's apartment when Mike started arguing with his wife. And Mike kept a, a 38 revolver in the refrigerator to keep it cool. And he went to the refrigerator, got the gun, turned around, and he shot his wife. He killed her, shot her point blank right in the head. 
and she was dead before she hit the ground. Um, Richard saw this, and Richard saw the blood squirting out of the wound. And as scary as that was, I'm sure it set the tone or the pace for his wondering about his own ability to do similar. It provided him a very distinct picture and perhaps even a blueprint for doing basically uh, the same kinds of behaviors later on. Richard dreamed about good and evil. He attended several churches but found no comfort. Then he discovered the Church of Satan. The Satanists preached that there are no sins and there are no ill consequences. Richard had found a home, a place where he could express his deepest urges. For someone like Ramirez, the central themes are certainly dominance, control, uh, sadism, power, and in a sense what we're looking at is somebody undoing the deprivations they suffered as a kid and taking control of these things. I'm no longer the victim, I'm now going to be the perpetrator. By his late teens, Richard Ramirez had left El Paso for Los Angeles. For years, he lived in cheap downtown hotels, wallowing in a dark underworld. He'd leave his room only at night to steal or to buy drugs. He'd spend hours cruising the city's freeways in stolen cars, listening to heavy metal music, adrift in his own world. And now, he was the most wanted man in California. The hunt for Richard Ramirez, when Crime Stories returns. <laughs>